Welcome to Abolition Democracy 213. My name is Bernard Harcourt, and I am honored to host this panel of brilliant critical thinkers this evening, including Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, Ivan Kalaf, Robert Gooding Williams, Kendall Thomas, and Chris Wolfe, for a critical engagement with W.E.B. Du Bois' writings on abolition democracy from his magnum opus, Black Reconstruction in America, published in 1935, and Angela Davis's writings and thoughts on abolition democracy uh, in her interviews with Eduardo Mendieta, published under that title in 2005. In homage to W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, we should, we must begin with his words. I do not think we could do justice to Du Bois here at Columbia University without both uh, giving him the first word and without recognizing our own institutional history. So let me begin tonight with this stunning and moving passage, the final words uh, of Du Bois uh, in Black Reconstruction. It's uh, on page 727 for those of you who have the text. The most magnificent drama in the last thousand years of human history is the transportation of 10 million human beings out of the dark beauty of their mother continent into the newfound El Dorado of the West. They descended into hell. And in the third century, they arose from the dead in the finest effort to achieve democracy for the working millions which this world had ever seen. It was a tragedy that beggared the Greek it was an upheaval of humanity like the Reformation and the French Revolution. Yet we are blind and led by the blind. We discern in it no part of our labor movement, no part of our industrial triumph, no part of our religious experience. And why? Because in a day when the human mind aspired to a science of human action, a history and psychology of the mighty effort of the mightiest century, we fell under the leadership of those who would compromise with truth in the past in order to make peace in the present and guide policy in the future. What a brilliant passage and what a sharp indictment. As Du Bois demonstrates, Columbia University was at the center of that blindness, that deliberate, willful blindness, worse, and was chiefly responsible for the revisionist history of the reconstruction, of the propaganda of history, as Du Bois writes, uh, with the white supremacist school of historians led by William Archibald Dunning and John William Burgess, who founded political science here uh, at Columbia University. Uh, so Du Bois writes on page 718, the real frontal attack on reconstruction came from the universities and particularly from Columbia and Johns Hopkins. The movement began with Columbia University and with the advent of John W. Burgess of Tennessee and William A. Dunning of New Jersey as professors of political science and history. As Professor Eric Foner writes, the fundamental flaw in the Dunning School was the author's deep racism, which shaped not only their interpretations of history, but their research methods and use of historical evidence. So it is only fitting uh, that we should try to begin this evening, uh, even in this minor way, to repair that collective harm, and at the very least, uh, by acknowledging uh, our part in that first. Our task this evening will be to critically engage abolition democracy, a, a term coined by Du Bois to denote the full ambition necessary to achieve racial justice in this country. An ambition that saw the light during certain moments of the reconstruction after the Civil War, but that was ultimately thwarted uh, by white resistance and terror, by a reign of white terrorism, especially in the South, and then that was ultimately abandoned with the political compromise of 1876 that resulted in the negotiated election of President Rutherford Hayes and the withdrawal of federal troops from the South. 
Du Bois argued that the reconstructive work necessary to achieve the full ambition of a racially just society required the construction of new institutions, new practices, new social relations that would have afforded freed black persons the economic, political, and social capital to live as equal members of society. As Du Bois wrote on page uh, 325 of the book, abolition democracy demands for Negroes physical freedom, civil rights, economic opportunity and education, and the right to vote as a matter of sheer human justice and right. And it is that full and uncompromised reconstruction of American society that Du Bois called the project of abolition democracy. Now, there is some ambivalence and some ambiguity in the term abolition democracy in this 700 plus page manuscript. Uh, insofar as it's mostly described as an enlightened, righteous, just ambition, but at other moments, uh, it is portrayed as an economically motivated, self-interested project uh, of uh, small capitalists and, uh, and labor uh, united in the myth of individualism. We will explore this tension. Uh, Derek Bell's theory of interest convergence is written all over Du Bois's text. We will explore all this with a remarkable panel, truly a, a star panel of critical thinkers. And I'll introduce them first because I'll be going down into the classroom shortly to put on a mask. We're joined first by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, who is university professor at Columbia University and a founding member of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. In 2009, Professor Spivak delivered the W.E.B. Du Bois lectures at Harvard University titled Du Bois at Large. Uh, and she's finalizing the book that is based on those lectures, uh, which is going to be called Du Bois and the General Strike. Uh, which is forthcoming from Harvard University Press. We are all familiar, of course, with her extensive writings uh, on post-colonial and subaltern studies and feminism and the politics of culture on Marx and Derrida and globalization. Her publications include the 2016 40th anniversary edition of Jacques Derrida's of Grammatology, um, Other Asias from 2003, An Aesthetic Education in the Age of Globalization, 2012, and Gadger Spivak has been an activist in rural education uh, and feminist and ecological social movements uh, since 1986. And actually, uh, in the background uh, this evening is uh, the, the, the place where uh, Gayatri Spivak works um, uh, in India and uh, will hopefully tell us about that when she begins to speak. We are also joined by another Du Bois expert, author of the remarkable book uh, In the Shadow of Du Bois, uh, Afro-Modern Political Thought uh, in America, uh, published in 2009 uh, by uh, Harvard University Press. Professor Robert Gooding Williams, uh, who is the M. Moran Weston Black Alumni Council Professor of African American Studies, Professor of Philosophy, Professor of African American uh, and African Diaspora Studies at Columbia University, uh, is the founding director of the Center for Race, Philosophy, and Social Justice. He is a prolific writer and the author as well of uh, Zarathustra's Dionysian Modernism from Stanford in 2001 and Look, a Negro, Philosophical Essays on Race, Culture, and Politics from Rutledge in 2005. Uh, welcome, uh, Bob. Uh, Ivan Kalaf uh, returns this evening. Thank you for joining us again, Ivan. Uh, you will all recall Ivan from our last seminar, uh, a dear friend and colleague here uh, at, uh, at uh, Columbia, a member of the band, The Freedom Trap, uh, which performed uh, at Abolition 113 and grew out of the Carnegie Hall Musical Connections program at Sing Sing Prison. Ivan Kadaf is a research assistant at the Social Relations Lab at Columbia University. Since joining the lab in August, he has served as a teaching assistant for courses at Sing Sing Correctional Facility. And currently he's a student in Columbia University School for Professional Studies uh, and is a Justice in Education Initiative Scholar. So we're thrilled uh, to have you back, Ivan. I'm also delighted that we will be joined as well by our dear friend and colleague, Professor Kendall Thomas, who is the Nash Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. 
Uh, Professor Thomas is one of the co-founders of Critical Race Theory, and he's the co-editor of the seminal collection, Critical Race Theory, the Key Writings that Founded the Movement, uh, published in 1996, uh, which he co-edited uh, and, of course, <laughs> contributed to. Um, he's the co-founder and director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture at Columbia Law School, and he's a founder of Amend the 13th, uh, a movement to amend the U.S. Constitution to end enforced prison labor. Uh, Professor Kendall joins us with his students from his Critical Race Theory seminar and our colleague and his co-teacher, Professor Flores Forbes. Uh, Professor Forbes is a writer, urban planner, and economic development expert, and is currently an associate vice president in the Office of Government and Community Affairs at Columbia. He's the author of two books on urban planning, issues, and race, uh, and his most recent publication is Invisible Men, a Contemporary Slave Narrative in the Era of Mass Incarceration. Uh, which won the 2017 American Book Award for Nonfiction. He also works with the Center for Justice, specifically on the university's justice and education agenda. Now, before we get started with our extraordinary panel, um, in a continuing effort to actualize and visualize and render uh, these ambitions uh, for social justice and abolition democracy contemporary and to ground the discussion, uh, I've invited Christopher Wolf to open the session this evening with a reading of his personal essay, The Most Beautifulest Thing in This World. So I'd like to welcome a dear friend and colleague uh, and say a word uh, about Chris Wolf. Um, it's been an extraordinary learning and growing experience for us all here at Columbia to have Chris Wolf with us over the past year and a few months. Uh, Chris Wolf uh, has been on campus at Columbia and sharing his brilliance with us as the inaugural artist in residence at the Eric H. Holder Jr. Initiative for Civil and Political Rights. Chris graduated from um, West Point, uh, the United States Military Academy in 2000, uh, and served as a field artillery officer in the US Army for six years. After completing his tours of duty and his military service, uh, Chris earned his MBA from Duke University and worked on Wall Street for five years before coming to Columbia to earn his MFA in creative writing. Chris currently teaches creative writing at Rikers Island to incarcerated students as part of Columbia University's Justice and Education Initiative. Uh, his writing has been featured in uh, Bomb Magazine, uh, Guernica, the New York Times Magazine, and several anthologies. Many of you may have seen the play on Broadway, A Soldier's Play, uh, written by Chris uh, Charles Fuller and directed by the Tony Award winner, uh, Kenny Leon. Uh, that's before Broadway was shut down uh, by this pandemic. Now, many of us uh, at Columbia went to go see it together. It was outstanding thanks in large part to Christopher Wolf, who was the military consultant for the play. So Chris, welcome. Uh, thank you. And uh, the stage is yours. Professor Harcourt, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, and take part in this very important conversation. Uh, as Professor Harcourt mentioned, the piece I'm going to be reading to you tonight uh, is titled The Most Beautifulest Thing in This World. And I'll be reading a truncated version of, of this personal essay, which I uh, wrote recently. The most beautifulest thing in this world is just like this. Standing at the corner of Amsterdam in 120 something, we waited for the lurking white man in the crosswalk signal to grant us permission to move about our business. When he appeared, we continued our journey away from Columbia's campus, headed towards parts of Harlem, less occupied by new age settlers, known for displacing the natives and Giuliani'ing the homeless. We've been planning this link up for a minute You'll be seeing me, Professor, you had said a number of times throughout the semester. However, when I first started teaching with the program, I had been forewarned that only a few students would come to campus and continue taking classes once released. I had been forewarned about the many factors determining the path of the formerly incarcerated, financial support, familial stability, struggles with addiction, whether or not an employer could see beyond labels to the person standing in front of them. It was an apt warning. 
at least two of the guys in our class were back in jail before our semester ended. A few others, when they were released, went down paths to which I'm not privy. But to be honest, I still look for them. And then there's you. You showed up on campus. You continued taking classes. Your word was your bond. And so here we were, walking in Harlem. We were headed to your place of employment, an invitation I hadn't expected, but appreciated, as it gave me a chance to see you enjoy what we both had longed for, your freedom. We passed corner stores and bodegas where, where you received head nods and pounds from black men from around that way. You told me how strange it was to come down to Columbia and be surrounded by white folks and resources in abundance, then go back home to see young black men and women with too few good options and too many negative consequences. You pulled a cell phone from your, cell phone from your pocket and showed me a picture of your close friends pointing out the ones that had been locked up since the photograph was taken. It didn't seem that there was a face you left untouched. Listening to you, I couldn't help but conjure in my mind the same, the same dangerous dichotomy running rife throughout our country's history. Anemic, resource-starved communities of color sitting if not adjacent, then in close proximity to flourishing white neighborhoods as if part of some cruel joke. As you talked, I saw the many black and brown faces in our classes at jail versus the scattered few in the classes I taught at, taught at on Columbia's campus. As you talked, I, re I recall my bed stop block, how during the financial crisis, streets of cracked up asphalt and potholes so big, they reminded me of bombed out Iraqi airstrips were suddenly paved clean over pristine pipes, bringing in new utilities as black households were being pushed out. As we kept walking, for some reason, you told me the charges that led to your incarceration. You hesitated mid-sentence and said that you didn't want this revelation to change the way I saw you. I assured you it wouldn't. How could it? When stepping into my fourth decade, I've seen too many times how clearly the line separating the free and incarcerated is one made malleable by money, power, and privilege. How could it when I've repeatedly walked jail hallways, seeing the walls swell with black bodies as if America has deemed it part of our natural progression? It's a sight that saddens, sobers, and arrests you in a way that no essay or intellectual exercise can or should. How could it change my view of you when in you I see clearly memories of my youth, memories filled with young brothers who smoke dope, some who sold coke, stuffed crack vials down tube socks on a mission to never go broke. We were black kids who knew the taste of a butter sandwich, had felt the weight of government cheese. Born into the cycle, our anger at the world left unleashed. We were me mugged and scruffed up. Some of us have been cuffed up, but regardless of who we were in that moment, we could never forget the kids we'd once been. Black boys with beautiful black smiles before we were cloaked in sin. Black boys who grew into Black men. Black men who came to understand that we faced the system designed to have us acting like corralled crabs, clipping and clawing at each other's limbs. Black men working to dismantle the system that put us in the barrel in the first place. We kept walking. You kept smiling. We turned east and headed towards Adam Clayton Powell. In the middle of the block, we stopped in front of what I assumed to be a public school building. Inside, you introduced me to your colleagues at an advocacy organization that supports court-involved youth. You took me upstairs to where classes were being held, and young kids of color canvassed the hallways carrying beautiful smiles I recognized. At each stop, someone offered you praise for the work that you were doing and the time and talent that you were pouring into the community. Back downstairs, you shared your goal of getting into social work with at-risk youth. We quickly talked up a straw man for how you could accomplish this before you gave me a pound and I went on my way. Many months have passed since that day. In that time, I taught another semester at the jail. I stood in a dimly lit visitor center, head bowed at the incarcerated student's request in a moment of silence for Tessa Majors before I presented their college credit certificates. In that time, I stopped by your work and left a copy of Angela Davis, an autobiography on your desk. I got your text confirming that you received it. In that time, the virus hit the city, shutting down everything, including educational programs on the inside. In that time, we lost Brianna, Ahmad, George, and Rashad, 
In that time, I've been enraged that it takes eight minutes and 46 seconds of torture for white people to reckon with the racist system that they know black folks have been dealing with for generations. In that time, I found out about Elijah adding more kindling to the fire. In that time, I revisited a piece I published over a year ago in the New York Times titled, Sir, I Never Thought I'd See the Day I'd Be Working for a Colored Officer. It's the piece that you and the guys used to jokingly ask me to autograph. I never told you this, but days after publishing it, I received a number of congratulatory phone calls and emails. I also received the message from a friend and mentor honing in on this paragraph I had written. It read, as a black veteran, I find it hard to reconcile my pride in my service with, with a sense of complicity in upholding my country's legacy of white supremacy while deployed. I still remember the black and brown faces of Iraqis I helped to round up, zip tie, and detain using tactics similar to stop and frisk, the use of which some courts in America have found to be unconstitutional. These experience, experiences created a moral chasm with which I continue to grapple. Of this paragraph, my mentor asked, how were you complicit? And if given a chance to reconcile, what would that look like? I delayed answering these questions for weeks, evading the necessary reflection to come up with this, this answer. I believe that I was complicit by allowing myself to reach a point where I devalued and allowed others to devalue the life of Iraq citizens in the same way that people of color have been and still are devalued in this country. I look back on those black and brown faces of detained Iraqis often. I see the Humvee headlights shining onto their hooded heads and blinded eyes. I hear the heavy metal guitar riffs blaring to keep them awake through the night. And I see me not doing a damn thing to stop it. I've come to believe that the reason I find it hard to reconcile this experience is because it can't be reconciled. The tension that exists within me from my service in Iraq will persist because it is something that I should live with. It is the humbling Janice head that helps me to see that you and so many of the incarcerated women and men I've encountered are and will be leaders that our communities need. That your voices and perspectives, now that the white power structure appears to be listening, are the ones that need to be heard. This irreconcilable tension is what keeps me coming back inside the jail, not to educate you, but to be educated by you. An education that I wasn't ready to receive during my adolescent years, occupying black Baptist church pews, one I couldn't receive at West Point, nor while obtaining two master degrees, one I would never receive working on Wall Street. It's an education that required me to be stirred by the words of Robert Wright, and to seek counsel from the likes of Jay Holder and Ivan Kalaf, to learn my craft from Mitch Jackson, and to be a better advocate from Jarrell Daniels. It is an education of the soul, one, that's helped, one that has helped me to see that the most beautifulest thing in this world is our collective freedom, the freedom from America's reckless oppression, freedom from her nonchalant knees on our necks, freedom to forgive, to evolve, to learn, to love. It is our freedom to come back home from our darkest place and for our remaining days, live life to its fullest. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, your personal essay captures in such a remarkable and profound way the connection between the promise of abolition democracy and our current punitive society. And through your work and through your teaching at Rikers and by accompanying the men and women who are incarcerated there, you are building something that the state does not provide, something that our society hardly provides, but that was part of the ambition of racial justice. But you also reveal how the criminal law and its enforcement became the tools, the key, the linchpin of how the white power structure returned this country to a caste apartheid society, how it pushed us, uh, to borrow Du Bois's words, to look backward, back towards slavery. The need for educational institutions and for justice in education now could not be greater. Uh, as both Democratic and Republican administrations got rid of Pell Grants and basically left everyone on the inside. 
to fend for themselves. What you also suggest in your essay, which I found particularly provocative, is the need for more than just education. You talk about the need for a new way to think about education, about who is being educated. And I, I hear the sound of Paolo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed uh, in the way you write about uh, coming back, uh, going back inside the jail, not to educate you, you were saying, but to be educated by you. And I hear the omnipresence or the repetition or the crystalline structure of racial injustice, of racial oppression in the layering on top of our domestic injustices, the injustices meted out to Iraqi citizens, uh, layer upon layers of white supremacy. You write, now that the white power structure appears to be listening. Yes, indeed, it seems to have taken another round of terrorism, of police killings, another round, another round I'm thinking here, of the reconstruction, the Memphis massacre of 1866, the lynchings that EJI has been documenting, the last round of terror with Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Laquan McDonald, uh, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Lando Castile. Now that the white power structure appears to be listening, you write, um, is this the time to return to Du Bois's idea of abolition democracy? Thanks so much, Chris. That was that was so powerful, um, and um, and I think it's the perfect start to help us think about this question. Uh, so why don't you uh, stay with us and then maybe join us uh, when we start the conversation. We're going to have panel presentations now, and then we'll go into conversation. Okay. Thanks so much, Chris. So to help uh, start us to think about this question, uh, I'm going to turn first to Bob Gooding Williams uh, with uh, deep gratitude for joining us this evening. Uh, as I mentioned, author of uh, In the Shadows of Du Bois, Afro-Modern Political Thought uh, in America. Uh, Bob, if you want to turn on your video and uh, join us now, um, the floor is yours. Um, my video isn't going on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you for sure. So I'm clicking on start video, but nothing is happening. Okay. Um, let me see. Do you have any... Mm, Oh, hold it. Okay. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Great. I see you're in your office. I am. Good. Okay. okay. Um, so I will uh, divide my comments uh, into two parts. Uh, first, I want to say something about Du Bois's development of a concept of abolition democracy in the opening pages of the Looking Forward chapter of Black Reconstruction. And then second, I want to connect uh, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction reflections on the failure of abolition democracy uh, to the subject of my post, uh, namely uh, Du Bois's analysis some 20 years earlier of the rise of democratic despotism and what following uh, J.R. Hobson he called the new imperialism. So uh, as I said, let me begin uh, with the opening pages of the Looking Forward chapter of uh, Black Reconstruction. Here it seems to me Du Bois invokes two important conceptual distinctions. The first is between two ideals, the ideal of abolition democracy and the ideal of compensated democracy. The second distinction is between the ideal of abolition democracy and the political movement of abolition democracy spearheaded by the self-sacrificing leadership of Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens. And with respect to that second distinction, I think I'll be addressing some of the worries that Bernard expressed earlier when he, when he was talking about the, uh, the ambiguity of the concept of abolition democracy. But first, the first distinction uh, between abolition democracy and compensated uh, democracy. So the ideal of abolition democracy is what Du Bois also calls the democratic ideal. The ideal of compensated democracy is, he tells us, in many minds confused with the ideal of abolition democracy. It is not a genuinely democratic ideal. 
The ideal of abolition democracy expresses, Du Bois says, a theory of universal democracy. Uh, du Bois points to this ideal and theory when he writes, and I'm quoting now, the true significance of slavery in the United States to the whole social development of America lay in the ultimate re relation of slaves to democracy. What were to be the limits of democratic control in the United States? If all labor, black as well as white, became free, were given schools and the right to vote, what control could or should be set to the power and action of these laborers? Was the rule of the mass of Americans to be unlimited and the right to rule extended to all men regardless of race and color? Or if not, what power of dictatorship would rule and how would property and privilege be protected?" End of quotation. Du Bois's democratic ideal, the ideal of abolition democracy, entails an extension of the right to rule to all men and women, regardless of race and color. He philosophically defends this ideal, his normative theory of universal democracy, in an essay entitled uh, The Rule of Men, a chapter of dark water that defends not only political but economic democracy, that is, democratic control of means of production. And I urge everyone interested in Du Bois and democracy to go back and take a look at that essay, the Rule of Men from Dark Border, 1920, where again, he lays out the normative conception of democracy, the ideal of democracy that's at work, I think, in his articulation of the concept of abolition democracy. What about compensated democracy, uh, 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 the ideal of compensated democracy? By contrast to the ideal of abolition democracy, the ideal of compensated democracy embraces as compensation for freedom from government, in, embraces as compensation for freedom from government interference with individual ventures and a voice in the selection of government officials, the ever possible increase of industrial income and implicitly the likely autocratic rule of the captains of industry. As I read Du Bois, the ideal of compensated democracy is essentially a libertarian ideal that accepts the norms of individual liberty and voter selection of government officials in exchange for the preservation of the possibility of capital accumulation. Okay, so so much for the distinction between compensated democracy, the ideal of compensated democracy and the ideal of abolition democracy. Let me now turn to the second distinction that between the ideal of, between the ideal of abolition democracy and the political movement of abolition democracy. As I read him, Du Bois distinguishes in a broadly Hegelian vein between the ideal or concept of abolition democracy and abolition democracy as it, has, as it has existed for its proponents, that is, as it has been understood by them. Thus, the proponents of abolition, of abolition democracy initially but mistakenly thought that endorsing the democratic ideal was consistent with holding the American assumption to be universally true. Later, a few clear-sighted men, Du Bois says, like Wendell Phillips, saw that this was false. In a similar vein, Du Bois argues that at the time of the Civil War, abolition democracy was, he says, pushed towards the notion of, di of a dictatorship of labor, although few of its proponents grasped, grasped the implications of this notion, namely that it necessarily involved dictatorship by labor over capital and industry. In sum, what both of these examples suggest, I think, is that Du Bois thinks that the concept, the ideal of abolition democracy has often exceeded or outstripped in its normative content, its advocates' understanding of its entailments, which is to say that its advocates have often misunderstood uh, uh, its entailments, the entailments of the normative concept of the ideal. Okay, let me now uh, turn to the connection between uh, uh, the argument of Black Reconstruction, and again, this notion of democratic despotism that Du Bois was developing uh, during the First World War, most prominently in an essay entitled African Roots of War, uh, published in 1915. So the key historical point is that the years 1875 to 1877 are absolutely critical for Du Bois, for they mark on one hand the end of Reconstruction and on the other, Stanley's foray into the Congo, and the initiation of a sequence of events leading to the scramble for Africa. In my post, I summarize Du Bois's understanding of democratic despotism, the European political formation, formation corresponding to the scramble, 
and to, again, what Du Bois calls the new imperialism. Du Bois' central thought is that the agents of the new imperialism are democratic nations comprising a unity of capital and labor. Obviously, these nations do not satisfy the democratic ideal, for they do not extend the right to rule to peoples of color, either domestically or internationally. Democratic despotism falls short of the ideal, but it is the historical successor to the shipwreck of the movement of, the movement of abolition democracy to realize the ideal. One sees this in the following passage from Black Reconstruction, which I read as invoking the concept of democratic despotism, if not the term itself. And this, this passage comes from the white worker uh, 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 chapter, um, but there are comparable passages elsewhere, for example, in the counter-revolution of property. Okay, in that chapter. So uh, uh, to quote Du Bois again, then came this battle called Civil War, beginning in Kansas in 1854, and ending in the presidential election of 1876, 20 awful years. The slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again towards slavery. The whole weight of America was thrown to color cast. The colored world went down before England, France, Germany, Russia, Italy, and America. A new slavery, and here I take him to be referring to the new imperialism, a new slavery arose, the new imperialism arose. The upward moving of white labor was betrayed into wars of profit based on color caste. Democracy died save in the hearts of black folk. And here I take him to be referring to the ideal of democracy. The resulting color caste founded and retained by capitalism was adopted, forwarded and approved by white labor and resulted in subordination of colored labor labor to white profits the world over. And here I take him to be, again, invoking this notion, not using the term, but invoking the notion of democratic despotism. Thus, uh, the majority of the world's laborers by the insistence of white labor became the basis of a system of industry which ruined democracy. And here again, uh, he invokes the ideal of democracy. So let me stop here uh, with Du Bois having the last word and uh, turn things over to uh, Gayatri. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, that's really helpful in distinguishing between uh, abolition democracy, compensated democracy, abolition, and the movement. Uh, and, and it raises this question whether how, how the ideal can exist in in a work that has such a kind of real politique of, uh, of, of, of economic interests. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a moment uh, when we get to the conversation. Uh, so yes, let me ask Gayatri Spivak to uh, turn on your video and join us and um, welcome. Thank you for joining us and the floor is yours but you'll need to turn on your microphone. Uh, thank you for asking me. Thank you. And um, I will repeat some things that Bob just said, but I think it bears repetition. My, obviously my reading is slightly different, but I'm gonna add a minute to my presentation, Bernard, because I do want to comment on the passage you quoted from The Price of Disaster, Abolition, Democracy, Demands, etc., page 200, 325 in the book. See, Du Bois writes very much in a kind of uh, chronological way. It's in, the, it's, in the, uh, uh, it's in the historical present, right? And he's saying here the year 1867 comes. See, Bob's uh, analysis was so beautifully coordinated in terms of time, timing. This is important. The year 1867 comes. Abolition democracy demands the Negro, for Negroes, physical freedom, etc. But in my reading, Du Bois is never um, idealistic about abolition democracy. The, he, his idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, in, and etc., which of course his Marxist friends did not want him to use, his, his, idea, his idea of democracy is more complicated. And on the very next page from the page that you read, Du Bois writes, the abolitionists were not enemies of capital. 
So it, this is the way he goes through the entire notion. I don't think it's now, I'm slightly critical of Angela's reading. Let me see if I can share screen with you. I've just, I've just, this is Angela and me in Berlin together. I've known her for a long time. I've just sent her my piece. It just, I just finished it quite recently. I sent her my piece because I am critical and I hope to discuss it with her in, um, uh, in the coming days. But so I go ahead and read. Um, let me first compare, I say, Angela Davis's notion of abolition democracy to Du Bois's analysis of the same phenomenon. Davis is of course aware of the connection between so-called democracy and the easy passage of capital, I quote her. The American version of democracy has become increasingly synonymous with capitalism and capitalism has become progressively more defined by its ability to roam the globe, end of quote. And she is of course spot on in noticing Du Bois's commitment to prison reform, citing this crucial sentence, Du Bois, this penitentiary system began to characterize the whole South and then referring, Davis does, to Du Bois's outcry against, I quote Du Bois again, prisoners for profit, peonage for criminals, as another form of slavery. But it seems to me that Angela Davis might be missing a little bit the subtlety of Du Bois's analysis when she argues, when Du Bois argues that the American assumption, what we old leftists call petty bourgeois ideology, small business ideology, Woodrow Wilson, everyone can be a captain of industry and so on, persuaded the freedmen as well. Of course, he's asking for education that comes first, page 220. Of course, he's asking for education, health, law, all over the place, all through the book. But he is asking, and this is what makes Du Bois unpatronizable by us. But he's asking for a greater epistemological change in the freedmen, because he's with them a greater epistemological change in the freedmen than we can recognize through a liberal binary opposition. Three short passages will have to do the extraordinary moment of implicit autocritique. I quote, two, and this is where um, Bob Gooding Williams was quoting from, beginning of Living Forward, two quite distinct, but, and notice these words, persistently undifferentiated visions. They're not two different visions. Persistently undifferentiated visions of the future dominated the triumphant North after the war. One was the prolongation, uh, as uh, Gooding Williams pointed out, of Puritan idealism, transformed by the frontier into a theory of universal democracy. But look at it, look at how he describes it. Prolongation of Puritan idealism universal democracy. The other trend was entirely different and is confused with the democratic ideal because the two ideals lay confused in so many individual minds as in us. This is me. This was the development of industry in America and of a new industrial philosophy. The validity of this American assumption lasted down to the Great Depression when it died with a great wail of despair, and Bob, sorry, I'm of course confusing two things here, but I don't have that much time, last, uh, died with a great wail of despair, not so much, not so much from bread lines and soup kitchens, as from poor and thrifty bank depositors and small investors. Democracy, that inevitable end of all governments, faces eternal paradox, Shall its power be a dictatorship for the benefit of the rich? And as, uh, as Draper points out, the word, that word dictatorship means like all of the assumptions will be dictated by the assumptions of some group or other. And it's a little bit different from the colloquial meaning. Uh, the, the, the shall its power be a dictatorship for the benefit of the rich, the cultured and the fortunate? This is the basic problem of democracy, writes Du Bois. And then he goes on to say, this is very important, 
the rank and file, I quote, the rank and file of the nation began to respond to the dictatorship of the rich. They responded, I quote, to the combined argument of industrialists and abolitionists, especially as their seeming unity of purpose increased. Greed, in the words of Olauda Ikeano, the improvident avarice of the black folks purchasers is a primary human affect and it feeds capitalism, which is negotiated by another primary human affect, pre-phenomenal desire for the other, indistinguishable from horror of the other, which feeds racism and sexism, pre-phenomenal. Ekiano is writing of the mid 18th century, of the mid 18th century, when industrial capitalism is already negotiating for control of mercantile capitalism. And indeed, if one looks at Du Bois after 1940, disappointed with how things were going for black folks in the United States, one sees him moving more and more towards separating the black effort from the general struggles. I will speak about Ambedkar later in this series, and I have often pointed out the difference between Du Bois and Ambedkar, but here I feel that Ambedkar's own sense that the Dalits should form a separate electorate, this is after 1940 Du Bois, which Gandhi foiled, was based on the same bitterness. When I spoke to Bernard about this event, I had mentioned gender. Joy James of Williams College gives a balanced account, I quote her, Du Bois's pro-feminist politics clearly marks his opposition to patriarchy and misogyny. Still, a masculinist worldview influences his writing and diminishes his gender progressivism. Du Bois rejects patriarchal myths about female inferiority and male superiority. Yet, Joy James continues, yet he holds on to a masculinist framework that presents the male as normative. Davis shows how, and I quote her, the prison uses sexualized abuse for social control. The aggressive masculinity, I keep quoting, of the inmates is matched by the sexual coercion enacted by the guards and wardens in prisons, end of quote. It is, however, harder to take a position against a still almost globally accepted normality when it is shared by such a grand figure as Du Bois. Yet there is no abolition without the abolition of reproductive heteronormativity running power in democracy. That was his question, who runs power? I wish I could go into the role of Dr. Virginia Alexander in the preservation of black reconstruction as reported to me personally and anecdotally by Du Bois's wonderful, powerful granddaughter, Du Bois Williams Irving. I cannot now, so I will rather mark Du Bois's patronizing acknowledgement of debt to the New England school marm, I quote, the New England school marm in the propaganda for the new abolition democracy, and move on to what I had mentioned to Bernard in our initial discussion, that I had read Tilly Olson's Tell Me a Riddle side by side with Du Bois's invocation of a riddle to the students at Hampton in 1906. Du Bois's remarks are particularly significant because the history of Hampton is deeply involved with the Black Reconstruction. In the early days, support for the Institute came from the Freedmen's Bureau, the Army's Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands, active between 1865 and 1872. That socialist oasis, Du Bois's words, which was blasted by the desert sands of a racialist capitalism is the story of Black Reconstruction. Du Bois says to the Hamptonians, I speak to you young teachers chiefly because you are the type and representative of that fateful class through whom the great army of tomorrow's men are learning the riddle of the world, the meaning of life and the life worth living. Tell me a riddle. A youngish man, Du Bois in 1906, speaking to men, although Hampton took both men and women, the women were honorary males, as it were. The metaphor is the army. The problem is the one Du Bois mentions with implicit autocritique, moving the self-interested recently desubalternized. Now, upwardly class mobile, petty bourgeois, back to the impassioned impersonal love of humankind. This is the riddle. It does not happen. 
It seems to have been the same riddle that troubled Du Bois and Olsen's protagonist, that when success came, the struggle was forgot. Olsen stages it by way of the denial of a public voice to women in general. It was Du Bois's great good fortune that he fell upon Shirley Graham, a woman who, from her life circumstances as well as her individual genius, did indeed claim the public voice. In Tilly Olsen's novel, it is a woman who had been part of the 1906 revolution in Russia, as were the author's own parents, and, when, and who, having become a wife, mother, and grandmother in the United States, in comfortable circumstances, patronized by husband, and maternalized by the rest, could not stop thinking about this riddle. I can't speak of David Rodiger's revolutionary time here. I would if there were time. She is staged as dying of cancer. And in her very last moments, she says, hunger, secret meetings, human rights, spies, betrayal, prison, escape. Her breath was too faint, I'm quoting. Her breath was too faint for sustained speech now, but the lips moved as a human being. Responsibility, dogma dead, war dead, one country. This riddle is still worth mentioning because of the special women's struggle that we are witnessing within the black struggle today. The declaration of many mothers of murdered children, black mothers, attempting to reach general social justice rather than just a ver good verdict for the killers of their own children. This is remarkable. This is the story. I believe we have not yet come to an end of this. Though I do think I have come to an end of my time, let me end with the words all too well known to us that Du Bois spoke in 1948, which are also often quoted. I quote, when I came out of college into the world of work, I realized that it was quite possible that my plan of training a talented tenth might put in control and power a group of selfish, self-intelligent, well-to-do men whose basic interest in solving the Negro problem was personal freedom and unhampered enjoyment and use of the world without any real care or certainty or no arousing care as to what became of the mass of American Negroes or of the mass of any people. My talented tent, I could see, might result in a sort of interracial free for all with the devil taking the hindmost and the foremost taking anything they could lay their hands on. I haven't the right to enter this critique, but Du Bois is my brother. And I really hear this. This is the autocritical. This is what brings us together. This is the autocritical class analysis that is a sustained requirement for all struggles. And this is why we cannot patronize him. As the dominant changes opposition to alternative, to quote Raymond Williams, I remind myself of what I said on October 2, the killers and the looters are today the true untouchables. And I just want to show you the picture, in fact, I don't seem to have it, so I can't show it to you. It's a picture of the, it's a picture of the, um, of the huge red um, um, man standing like this, who is the general strike figure of the IWW, the Wobblies, which really puts the entire context of my discussion. I'm a, I'm a little, I've spoken a little longer than perhaps you wanted me. No, not that much longer. I wanted me to speak but I just wanted to fit everything in. Thank you very much, Bernard, for giving me Thank this. Thank you. Time. Thank you, Gayatri. That was uh, amazing. You've added uh, imp at least four dimensions uh, to, the, to the conversation that I think are crucial uh, to continuing the conversation uh, with Bob Gooding Williams. The first one was this question about Angela Davis's idealism uh, in her reading uh, of Abolition Democracy, which was where we, where we ended with uh, Bob. Um, but it's interesting, and and because in part, uh, even if it's an idealist reading, she shares the political economy, uh, right? She shares entirely the kind of underlying political economy. Well, we'll come, we'll we'll have a conversation about this. But uh, of uh, Du Bois, and in understanding uh, the, um, in understanding the way in which the uh, capitalist profit motive uh, pushed us out of uh, reconstruction and has shaped the present carceral state. 
uh, which is another. The autocritical element is key, which you mentioned as a, as a, as a third dimension. And then also, thank you for bringing in Davis's discussion of the sexual dimension of the prison, which ties directly to Kendall Thomas's essay, uh, which was also on the readings today, Envisioning Abolition, Sex, Citizenship, and the Racial Imaginary of the Killing State. So thank you, uh, Gayatri, for that. Uh, let me now turn to Ivan Kalaf uh, to give us his uh, reactions and thoughts uh, with regard to the readings. And uh, Ivan, you've got your video turning on. Excellent. Does him? Wonderful. Uh, it's um, it's still black, but you're you're appearing. But uh, there you go. There you go. Now, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for joining me. us. Thanks for having me. First, I want to say thank you to everyone on the panel. Chris, uh, I want to give a special shout out to Chris. Uh, uh, that thing, uh, that thing you read made me super emotional, and I appreciate the way you sort of included uh, the cadences and the rhythms of hip hop inside of your inside of your reading, which is amazing. Um, and I appreciate you guys. Uh, I'm not going to even try to compete with you guys' analysis of this guy's work. Uh, I'm just gonna give you some of my own personal uh, experiences and ideas, and hopefully I can add value to this conversation. So I read the readings and I, uh, some of the stuff was pretty intense. Some of the stuff was pretty confusing. I had to reread it, uh, it was pretty deep. Uh, so let me just give you a little, by way of background, a little, a little bit about myself. So I grew up my entire life, 85% of my life in, some type of institution, whether it was foster care, foster uh, juvie, juvie halls, Rikers Island, state prison, uh, my entire life. So I've seen, I've experienced, I've lived and I've breathed uh, the damage that uh, our systems of incarceration, our systems of uh, law, uh, I've seen what they can do. I mean, I know that the prison does it. If anyone thinks that prison in any way uh, helps or heals people, I'm going to disabuse you of that notion really quickly. Uh, what prison does, it, it reduces, it, it diminishes, it decreases, it hurts, it wounds, uh, anything it touches, whether, the, whether it's the men who are housed in those facilities or the guards who work there, all the employees that work in those facilities. Uh, and I think one of the main messages one of the main messages that I got from the readings was that uh, abolitionists are builders, right? It's not just about doing away with stuff, it's about building. And uh, I think what, what, what gives abolition uh, its force and its persuasive is that it works on two fronts, right? It works on the emotional front. It appeals, I mean, it speaks to uh, love, right? That we should love each other. We should care about each other. We should help each other. Uh, uh, it focuses on on the humanity, on our humanity. Um, and it also uh, works on the logical front, has a logical appeal, right? It, it says that the that these systems and these institutions of oppression, all right, the cost of maintaining these systems outweigh the benefits. It's, it's pretty simple, it's pretty simple math. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, a lot of people like to say that abolitionists, so I, I don't, I don't say I am an abolitionist or I'm a reformist. I'm not sure. You know, I, like I said last time I spoke, uh, because I've been uh, involved in these systems for so long, it's very difficult for me to imagine a world without them. And I'm sure I'm probably not the only person. Um, um, but we know, uh, so a lot of people will say, well, listen, a world without prisons is crazy. That'll never happen. Will never happen, but we know that in this country, in America, there are cities that have relatively low crime rates, uh, virtually zero crime rates, right? And we don't know why that is, but we know that it is. So it's not that far a leap, right, to say that we don't need the police, we don't need prisons to keep crime rates low. They don't, they don't do that, right? We have to find other ways. We have to find different methodologies and ideologies. Um, and, you know, people argue that prisons will always be necessary because uh, they believe that, you know, uh, people will always be bad. Some people are inherently bad, particularly black and brown people. That's a narrative. 
that there's an inherent badness about those folks. Um, and, and that reasoning is clearly erroneous, right? It's, it's crazy. Um, but to think that because a person has exhibited certain behavior in the past, that that sort of determines that that person will behave that same way always or in, 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 in perpetuity is craziness, right? Uh, uh, when we assume that we can judge the full range of possibilities of human behavior based on, uh, on some evidence of past behavior, uh, we sort of end up collapsing a person's entire being into one thing. And I think that's, uh, um, and I think uh, that's the message that I got sort of from the reading that, that we have to look past uh, behaviors because behavior is not the problem, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a manifestation of a deeper problem. And once we fix those deeper problems, those societal ills, then maybe we won't, maybe those behaviors will take care of themselves. And I just want to say, I just wanted to read a quote from uh, Angela Davis from her reading. Uh, and she said, the challenge of the 21st century is not to demand equal opportunity to participate in the machinery of oppression. Rather, it is to identify and dismantle those structures in which racism continues to be embedded. This is the only way the promise of freedom can be extended to the masses of people. So, so the lie of diversity, right? So we talk about diversity. So simply sprinkling black and brown faces in the institutions and systems that uh, uh, deal in oppression is not enough, right? That, that doesn't work because those systems are still operating business as usual. Uh, so I, I um, it begins with you know unlearning the con the carceral logic, right? In the system, in this country, we have this carceral logic that it seems that uh, 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 that this is that uh, this is how we solve our problems. We lock people away. We lock our problems away. We put them in cages, and that uh, clearly doesn't work. Um, however, just doing away with those systems is not enough. You know, we have to build. We have to create. And, and that implies and assumes that we work together. We have to work together. It doesn't matter what color, what, what God you pray to, how much money you have. If we work together, right, then we can build those structures. Uh, uh, we can build those systems that help humanity move forward. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about love. It's about caring. It's about taking care of each other ultimately. And, it's, uh, and we can theorize and we can... Uh, do all those sorts of things, but until we act, until we love, until we care, it doesn't matter. You know, all the talking and all the stuff that we do doesn't matter. So, um, uh, yeah, I just, I don't, you know, I, I, uh, I'm sort of, uh, I'm still stuck on uh, Chris's uh, reading. It was, just, it was just an amazing, uh, it touched me, and I, and I just want to say thank you to everybody. I, I think I'll end there. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you so much. And particularly for bringing uh, Angela Davis back into the conversation and to pointing us to these particular passages uh, that you read that I think are, that are so important. Um, I mean, you mentioned the passage on page 26 that has to do with kind of um, uh, how uh, the civil rights movement achieved some things like putting some black people in place, positions of power, Colin Powell, uh, Condoleezza Rice, but how in it, how how more than how how much more is needed, right? And so this vision that Angela Davis offers that you know, where she writes at the top of page eighteen, a victory is not so much to secure change once and for all, but rather to create new terrains for struggle, right? Um, and that idea of creating new trains for struggle, I think that's exactly what you're talking about, which is this need to create renewed in, new, new institutions, this, this path forward uh, that is so important uh, to Angela Davis. Um, this path forward that, that she traces and finds uh, uh, in, Du Bois's, in Du Bois's work, um, which of course, and, and so, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come to this when we come to the conversation. The question is how to kind of reinterpret these ideas of Du Bois uh, in the current context, right? And how does it change in the punitive society that we live in today? So thanks for 
uh, putting those on the table. Thanks for everything uh, you do, Ivan, as well. All right. Uh, let me turn uh, next to my dear friend and colleague, Kendall Thomas. Thank you for joining us. I know that you uh, have your students here as well uh, because you were just teaching your, uh, your seminar on critical race theory. So thanks for joining us. Great, thank you for inviting me. I'm simply going to uh, say what I have to say and look forward to our conversation. Good. Uh, taking uh, the 15th chapter of Black Reconstruction in America as a point of departure, I'd like to offer some thoughts on the connection between abolition democracy and what we might call abolition education. Uh, I want to develop two claims, both of which flow from my reading of Du Bois's account of the civic leadership of African Americans in bringing public education and public schools uh, to the South during Reconstruction. I want very briefly to develop two separate claims. The first is a point uh, about the uses and limits of legal categories as a tool of historical periodization. And the second is a point um, about the claims of the historical past on our historical uh, present. In his introductory post for this week's 1313 session, my beloved colleague and our convener, Bernard Harcourt, invites us to see the history of slavery and emancipation and the control of Black lives in America as a movement from propertization to criminalization, uh, from property law to criminal law. He writes, and I'm reading him, uh, with the demise of reconstruction, the criminal law and its enforcement replaced property law as the key to confine freed black persons to a condition of quasi slavery through the implementation of black code, codes that impose severe punishments and labor restrictions on African American men and women. Now, as I read it, Du Bois's chapter on the founding of the public school complicates the narrative of preservation through replacement and the image of a juridical break between the dominant legal paradigm that white supremacy deployed during this period to perpetuate its cultural dominion its economic dominance and its political domination of black Americans. The case for a more complicated picture and periodization might start with an observation Du Bois makes early on in the chapter when he notes that, quote, the mass of the slaves could have no education. The laws on this point were explicit and severe, unquote. What Du Bois neglects to say is that the laws forbidding the education of slaves were criminal laws that imposed criminal sanctions. The criminalization and criminal punishment of learning while black was behind the enactment of the Virginia Revised Code of 1819, uh, a statute that anticipated the adoption in the 1830s of similar laws in almost all the other slaveholding states in the wake of the Nat Turner revolt of 1831. The Virginia law prohibited, I'm quoting, all meetings or assemblages of slaves or free Negroes or mulattoes mixing and associating with such slaves at any meeting house or houses, et cetera, in the night or at any school or schools for teaching them reading or writing either in the day or night under whatever pretext shall be deemed and considered an unlawful assembly. The law permitted police officers to quote, inflict corporal punishment, unquote, with a whipping of up to 20 lashes. In America then, the regime of chattel slavery was a regime of what I would call compulsory illiteracy, which used criminalization and criminal sanctions to prohibit and punish the education of enslaved African-Americans. This prehistory 
of criminalization and of governance through crime, to use Jonathan Simon's phrase, is all the more remarkable when one considers that the United States is apparently the only country in the world that is known to have outlawed and punished slave literacy. In my view then, the pre-war criminal sanctions on attempts by enslaved people to acquire literacy suggest that the post-war reliance on criminal law as a tool for the continuation of slavery by other means was not a radical paradigm shift, but rather an enlargement, an, ampl an amplification, and an intensification of political strategies of containment and control using law uh, that began during slavery and became part of the afterlife of slavery and the abortion of abolition democracy. This brings me to my second point. Du Bois's account of the African-American struggle for literacy and of the way the rhythm of united effort, which is a phrase he uses uh, in, in, in one of the opening paragraphs, the rhythm of united effort expressed in the demand for universal public education was at the heart of Black Reconstruction is important, not only for its interpretation of our historical past, but for the critical resource it offers us in making sense of our historical present. The central argument of the chapter on the founding of the US public school and one of the central themes of Black Reconstruction is that there's something like a constitutive connection between abolition democracy and what I've called abolition education. The founding generation, and I use that phrase deliberately, realized as Frederick Douglass wrote in My Bondage and My Freedom, I'm quoting Douglass here, that education and slavery are incompatible with each other. This is Du Bois. They wanted to know, they wanted to be able to interpret the Kabbalistic letters and figures, which were the key to more. They were consumed with curiosity at the meaning of the world and wanted to make sense of the upturning of the universe and revolution of the whole social fabric they had just experienced. Black Americans understood that literacy was not just a bulwark against the predations of slavery, but a precondition a property, and indeed a practice of freedom. Black Americans, writes Du Bois, were consumed with desire for schools, unquote, because they saw quite clearly that the founding of the public school was first and foremost an experiment in democracy. This is Du Bois's phrase. Not just for themselves, but for the poor whites who had also been denied the rudiments of education. As Du Bois writes in the South, quote, the first great mass movement for public education at the expense of the state came from Negroes. Public education, he goes on to say, and I'm quoting, public education for all at public expense was in the South a Negro idea. I love this idea of um, the Negro idea. In a sense then, culturally, Black Reconstruction and the campaign for mass public education in which African-Americans were the vanguard marks the beginnings of American political modernity as a lived possibility, if not a fully achieved reality. The African-American frenzy for school, as Du Bois puts it, led to quote, an organized effort for education in those years between 1861 and 1871 that Du Bois argues was quote, one of the marvelous occurrences of the modern world, almost without parallel in the history of civilization. The movement that was started was irresistible. It planted the free common school in a part of the nation and in a part of the world where it had never been known and never been recognized before, unquote. And they did so knowing that the Southern white communities in which they were seeking to create a culture of black literacy was quote, more hostile to the establishment of schools than they are to owning lands. 
Although it was inclusive, the project of abolition education envisioned by African-American abolitionist Democrats and their allies was not colorblind. How could it be given the history of racialized compulsory illiteracy or given the racial history of compulsory illiteracy and the constitutive and continuing connection in this country between race, race, race and literacy and racism and illiteracy. The right to literacy that African-Americans demanded, the literacy without which racial democracy would remain elusive was then, I want to suggest, a species of racial literacy. The legal scholar Lonnie Guineer has defined racial literacy as, quote, the capacity to decipher the durable racial grammar that structures racialized hierarchies and frames the narrative of our republic, unquote. The racial literacy whose foundations were laid by this generation would become a critical resource in the ongoing African-American project of writing, and not always with words, a counter narrative of our republic. And I've become especially mindful of this in the last uh, months, um, observing the ways in which the Trump administration has weaponized black literacy, black racial literacy, and its understanding of white supremacy. Finally, this generation of African-Americans created learning communities that built and bequeathed the inner culture whose emergence Du Bois describes in the closing uh, paragraph of the chapter on the founding of the public school, which by way of a conclusion, I want to read to you now. This is Du Bois. They avoided the mistake, this generation, of trying to meet force by force. They bent to the storm of beating, lynching and murder, and kept their souls in spite of the public and private insult of every description. They built an inner culture, which the world recognizes in spite of the fact that it is still half strangled and inarticulate. I want to suggest that that inner culture, one of the expressions, the public expressions, uh, the contemporary public expressions of that inner culture of black learning is critical race theory. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you. Um, that's a perfect. That's a perfect way to end and to push us into the present, uh, theoretically, with critical race theory. Uh, so uh, let me see. Uh, I, I I think I'll I'll stand somewhat corrected that um, the claim that we moved from property law to criminal law may be too blunt an instrument. Um, but it is intended to get at a particular aspect or a dominant aspect in which today uh, uh, relations of power play out uh, because uh, this is not to suggest that there isn't, there aren't similar forms uh, in property law today. And of course, you know, with redlining and uh, Kianga Taylor's book, which uh, describes the history of uh, real estate profiteering uh, on and, uh, and creation of two-tiered society through property, there's no question that uh, the property law continues to play a role, and there's no question that criminal law did as well. But the transition from slavery to convict leasing, which is so central to, to um, Du Bois' work, uh, and his, which he showed us so powerfully, and which is what then grounds the movement towards uh, the carceral state and mass incarceration, uh, does suggest something about uh, uh, so about a, a, a different a diff about the not unique tool, uh, but an, a, an aggrandized role for uh, criminal law enforcement. And, and in that vein, I think it would be interesting to, uh, uh, this would be something that would require a lot more research, but um, in my study of antebellum criminal law, I often saw the criminal law as actually taming 
uh, the forms of domination that were taking place. In other words, the criminal laws being the, the device that could be used as a way to, to render more palatable white supremacy by creating a right to a defense, a right to an attorney in a capital case where, where a person who was enslaved was accused of a crime. Um, and by making it appear as if there were forms of, uh, of protection against the excesses in a way, which I, 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 you know, I would need to think more about this. This is a hypothesis, but whether that gets flipped on its head after the end of slavery uh, to put criminal law in a different posture, really. But that was really helpful. And also thank you for bringing us back to the issue of education, which is so central as you showed us uh, to this work, to the abolition democracy ideal of creating that institution as one of the most important born within the uh, movement itself of uh, freed uh, black persons. So that is uh, critical. And we'll, we'll talk about that too more because it ties so importantly to the work that's being done here in terms of justice and education. Okay, so let me invite let me invite everyone on the panel to turn on your videos so that we can, uh, we can have a conversation. I'd like this to be as informal as possible. I'd like people to interrupt each other. Uh, I'd like this to be as if we were uh, not simply virtual, but all of us together in the same room uh, having our conversation. Um, let's see, Bob, if you're, uh, if you're able to turn on your screen as well, um, because I wanted to start, thanks, and thank you, uh, Professor Forbes also for joining us. Um, you were just co-teaching the seminar I know with Kendall Thomas and I appreciate you being here with us as well. Um, so I wanted to start with this notion of the idealism of Angela Davis's idealism, the concept of uh, abolition democracy and um, you know, whether how, how that strand of an ideal Bob, you had tried to distinguish that from the social movement, whether that is, whether that can survive in this, in this text uh, as an ideal, given how, given how this text is a political economic story uh, of the transformations, um, whether, whether an ideal can survive in the materialism of the text in Du Bois or whether, uh, and, or, and whether, but whether we need it uh, in Angela Davis's work to give us something to work towards what, what Ivan was talking about, right? So Bob, you wanna, do you wanna start by addressing that particular question? All right, so look, I agree, I think that, uh, Du Bois is not an idealist, idealist if being an idealist means ignoring political economy. On the other hand, I think that, and so obviously Du Bois doesn't ignore political economy, but I think that uh, Du Bois's analysis and argumentation uh, runs along two tracks. That is to say, it's at once causal and normative. It involves causal analysis in, in, the, in, in, in the vein, say, of political, in the vein, say, of political economy, but it also involves normative assessment. And so when he's thinking about Wendell Phillips or he's thinking about uh, the failure to see the full implications of abolition democracy on the part of some of its proponents, he's measuring uh, the self-understanding of its proponents against his conception of the ideal, point number one. Point number two is uh, the ideal is not, uh, uh, as it were, um, a, a mere abstraction. I think from dark water on through Black Reconstruction, and now I want to uh, make a point connecting to some of what Kendall was saying, Du Bois is always thinking about uh, the ideal in terms of um, uh, its institutional requirements. That is to say, um, uh, uh, fully to think through the ideal of abolition democracy is to think through um, uh, 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 the it is to think through its institutional articulation. That is to say, to ask the question, I mean, Again, I think Hegel is a useful point of reference to ask what 
does the realization of the ideal require in institutional terms? What does the realization of the ideal require in institutional terms? And I took part of a Kindle, I took Kindle to be saying in part that the point of the, the point of chapter 15 of, 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 of Black Reconstruction is to say, look, the ideal of a, 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 a abolition democracy has uh, some specific institutional requirements having to do with uh, uh, educational practice and educational uh, educational practices and institutions. So the ideal, the normative assess, ass, assessment is there in each and every term, but that doesn't mean that he's not thinking institutionally. No, neither does it mean that he's not thinking in terms of uh, 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 causal uh, 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 analysis in the spirit of political economy. He can, you know, keep more than one ball in the air at the same time. Right. He's a smart right. guy. I'd like to, I'd like to, Focus on this one passage. If you if you have the text, at least this version of it, it's on 83. It's actually the uh, final paragraph of chapter four um, of uh, of uh, a reconstruction of Black Reconstruction in America of Du Bois's text. It's on page 83 of Du Bois's text, and it's the it's the last it's the last paragraph of chapter four. And and towards the he's he's um, this is in the general strike, the chapter on the general strike. And so it's the last paragraph of chapter four and he's describing, and he writes uh, on the, he writes in the middle of the paragraph, on the other hand, there was a minority of the North who hated slavery with perfect hatred, who wanted no union with slaveholders, who fought for freedom and treated Negroes as men. And then he writes, as the abolition democracy gained in prestige and in power, they appeared as prophets and led by statesmen they began to guide the nation out of the morass into which it had fallen. They and their back friends and the new freedmen became gradually the leaders of a reconstruction of democracy in the United States while marching millions sang the noblest war song of the ages to the tune of John Brown's body. I mean, I, I find that passage uh, enlightening, particularly for what you're suggesting, Bob, because there's this notion that uh, they this that that somehow persons who were so fundamentally opposed to slavery in their being somehow become the prophets of abolition democracy. Um, as abolition democracy gains prestige, they appeared as prophets. I mean, so, so there is something there about, uh, an, I, about an ideal, right? And, and the notion of prophet has in it a notion of ideal. Um, and that seems to suggest uh, that there was an, an idea also, right? Even if it's not, uh, um, even if it might, even if we might not want to call it idealist, but that there was an idea also somehow that gets picked up uh, in the movement for abolition democracy. Um, Bob Gayatri, is is that passage helpful or or to to what you were saying? Gayatri, turn on your your uh, your mic, please. Okay. Yes, and in fact, I believe when Bob was talking about Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, these were yes. two of the, of the, of the prophets and right. perhaps Garrison, perhaps uh, Schultz, who was not really a, uh, um, uh, he was German American, right? And um, some others, but in the chapter where I, I'll come back to this passage, but in the chapter where then Du Bois begins to quote at length what Sumner said and what that is Stephen said, et cetera, et cetera, what we begin to see that is that this, uh, uh, in, the fourth, in the fourth essay of Souls of Black Folk, Du Bois writes, and this is a revision of its magazine publication, that the war amendments brought in a problem that we have not solved until today. And indeed, as election, the voter suppression, et cetera, happens now, how prescient he was. So to an extent, that whole chapter where Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner and Sumner being beaten down, et cetera, et cetera, 
are quoted at length so that in fact you're not listening to Du Bois, you're listening to these people, speech after speech. I think what we see is the history of the war amendments and how useless they became because of racism. And so it seems to me it's a wonderful introduction. I mean, even in, uh, in uh, Kendall's founding the public school, the in third chapter, third paragraph, um, the advance of the Negro in education helped by the abolitionists was phenomenal, but the greatest step was preparing his own teachers, the gift of New England to the black South. That was, and I said that was for the women, it was a patronizing tone the school moms. But this particular story, I think, is being, uh, being uh, recounted here. But I will say that, the jo that John Brown's body is an extremely important thing there. Because as Frederick Douglass and uh, Du Bois both said that the emancipation really began with John Brown, and he was no abolitionist. So mm -hmm. to an extent, the idea of John Brown, and I think Chandler uh, has written very uh, convincingly with long analysis that Du Bois's biography of John Brown, which many think he himself thought was his best book, that he, it represents John Brown as an African-American, although he was a white guy. So to an extent, it seems to me that here we see that all of those things together, because what is it that the general strike says? We can't forget that. It says, it clearly says something that most people just pretend, you know, that people actually won their own freedom. You know, generally somebody else organized something which is not being mentioned. But here Du Bois actually shows that the so-called fugitive slaves who became the contraband as Butler, call, Butler called them, that they actually did change the direction of the entire civil war and they were the ones who were who were the those enslaved people walking off the plantation downing their tools that they should be understood in that way and that they actually were the ones who made the whole thing possible it was self it was made by the enslaved and there i think the idea of education is something that will come so that they can be rewarded for this extraordinary gift of being illiterate, of having no uh, connection one with the other, but nonetheless having actually designed the agency of their own freedom. Self-made. This is whether he was right or wrong. There's a lot of dispute, but it's certainly worth considering that argument. And that's where at the after having said that it was the enslaved fugitive downing the tools, joining the Union Army, and then being welcomed as contraband, <laughs> these were the ones who made it. The, then it, it is that he begins to say also that there were uh, uh, whites who acknowledged this change, and therefore we go along. There just one last thing, I don't want to talk too long, but one last thing, what he saw in these men, even before they were freed, was a surprising ability to move into the principles or the structural principles of the Freedmen's Bureau and so on, of uh, what we call democratic principles. And I would like to say, uh, just as Bob Gooding Williams mentioned Africa, that in his last years, what he was trying to see was, since the, the, uh, the, the, the enslaved were kept from uh, education. If indeed, with all the waves of, the, of the, the enslaved coming, they were not primitive savages, they, especially the ones that were coming from Dahomey, etc. What did they bring? What kind of history are we supposed to think? How long does it last when you're not allowed to be educated another way? So it's not just music, but also this access without romanticizing the African, um, African situations, uh, to access the structural principles of democratic behavior. So I think the end of this section is very important because it's after acknowledging that the emancipation, the real agents were those enslaved 
uh, folks who ran off and joined the army, they changed the direction of the civil war from north against south to a war against uh, against slavery. Sorry. Mm -hmm. no. Thank you, Gayatri. Uh, yeah. And so, so um, and I, I want to I want to get to the the questions of education in a, in a in a split second because I think that that can bring in. Uh, more conversation, but I do want to give Bob an opportunity to 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 address this question at least one one more time, maybe with this with this formulation. Gayatri, you're entirely right that there's so, so long passages of Charles Sumner and uh, Thaddeus uh, Stevens that are in uh, that are in this text that um, that speak so eloquently. Um, Bob, do you did you did you did you get a sense that there was though a kind of political economic ulterior motive behind and because I don't see it in his reading of uh, Sumner and Stevens uh, and so and so maybe that's a place where the idea comes in in a more uh, clean way uh, rather than being immersed in the pillar of the economy. Yeah, I mean, it's all very uh, complicated. I'm not sure what I think about, I, 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 well, just two, two points. One is, I mean, Gatry is absolutely right. I mean, you know, she's, she, she points to, you know, uh, a moment in the text where in, in some sense, Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois' voice disappears and you get endless, quote, you, you, get, you get long stretches of quotation by, um, uh, of, of, of speeches by uh, uh, other persons, and that's not the only that's not the only place in the text where that happens. And that's that's an interest, and that, 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 that that's a very interesting feature of the way in which the text is is, is organized. Um, and you know what what I particularly appreciate about Gadry's point is that, is, that, is that we have to kind of take that seriously as um, you know as a principle of textual organization. It's just not Du Bois hurrying along, if you will. So, so that's something to think through. I think very, very carefully. And so, I, 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 I'm, I'm very much on board with like what I think is the, uh, 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 the impulse animating um, uh, uh, Gayatri's remarks on that point. Um, with respect to the issue of uh, philosophy, prophecy, political economy, I'll, I'll just, I'll just um, restrict myself to saying that 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 it's all very complicated, which, which may sound like a cop, cop out, but but because we know it's all very complicated, I, you know, you don't need me to tell you that. But just the but, but, but it's complicated in a particular way that, um, to which Du Bois alerts us. If you take a look at the uh, propaganda of history chapter, I think from which you were quoting, from the end of which you were quoting uh, early on, Bernard, yeah. it, on page seven, uh, 722, yeah. uh, it's quite striking what uh, 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 Du Bois has to say in the second full paragraph on that page. Um, Starting in the first place? Um, uh, I'm saying in the first place, yes, in the first, yep, yes, yep, in the okay. first place, somebody in each era must make clear the facts with, with utter disregard to his own wish and desire and belief. What we have got to know so far as possible are the things that actually happened in the world. Then, so that I think is pointing to kind of, you know, causal, you know, social scientific, scientific action, what Du Bois, du Bois generally calls in the paragraph you quoted, the science of the science of action, the science of human action. And he's been, Du Bois has been working with that category at least right. since, I don't know, sociology hesitant 1905. So, right. so sociological inquiry as, uh, as, as a science of human action. But then notice what he adds. Um, then with that much clear and, and, and open to every reader, the philosopher and prophet has a chance to interpret these facts. But this historian has no right posing a scientist to conceal the distort facts. And until we distinguish between these two functions of, uh, of the chronicler of human action, we are going to render it easy for a muddled world, uh, render it easy for a muddled world out of sheer ignorance to make the same mistake 10 times over. So my point is that he's he's always got, you know, if we read the book in light of those remarks, then then I think we can read, read the remarks as kind of an invitation to read the, 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 the book as a whole with an eye to moments where Du Bois is, you know, you know, uh, invoking the perspective, the voice of the prophet and the philosopher and on the one hand and on the other hand, with an eye to those moments where Du Bois is invoking uh, uh, the voice, the perspective of the, of the, of, of the social scientist or, or, or the historian, the, you know, the person who's interested in 
uh, 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 getting clear about uh, social regularities and the like. Let me just, just say one thing. Thaddeus Stevens was a bit more politically, economically inclined than Charles Sumner. They were not identical. I mean, that distinction is made again and again in that chapter, that Thaddeus yeah. Stevens thinks more about the economic than does Charles Sumner. Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for that, both uh, Gayatri and Bob. Um, and it, it is, it is it, it, that, that distinction then um, uh, between the philosopher and the historian, between the philosopher and the scientist then um, could do a lot of work in how we think about abolition democracy in, in, the, in the sense that then Angela Davis here would be entering as the philosopher, uh, creating, creating an opportunity which Gayatri, you were somewhat critical of, but of, of, of turning fact or scientific history or history fact, right, uh, into, an, uh, into an ideal, right, into something. Well, I to... wasn't really calling her an idealist. This is a conversation Angela and I have, have had before, that okay. Du Bois was constantly looking at uh, both sides rather than dividing both sides. And I, I must also say what I wrote in my email to her today, that it was an interview situation. A student popped the question, okay, right. former student. And so, you know, the, her devotion to Du Bois, and this happens to all of us. We take something from someone whom we admire greatly, then we cook it in our heads into something else. And in fact, later, a week later, I go and look at the actual passages, which I thought I had completely digested, and the passage is a little bit different. So I'm right. looking forward to my discussion with Angela. A little bit, I think, is because she has inter internalized Du Bois in a certain way, and so she sees it as all good, and this is what we need. God knows those are practical things that she says. They're not right. very idealistic. I'm not saying she's idealizing him. I'm just saying that she's not looking at the fact that Du Bois is always, uh, uh, this is why education is so important. It's right. It, the, the, he needs, he wants an epistemological change in the freedmen and not be taken in by the petty bourgeois ideology, which he accuses Abraham Lincoln of having too, which is all around them and which can tempt them because those who have nothing cannot not want. So therefore, it's a complicated issue. So anyway, yeah. I wanted yeah. to make... Yeah. No, that's a great segue. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great segue, I think, to to the to the education question, uh, which is so rich and on the table right now. And so I want to bring in, uh, I want to bring back in, uh, Kendall and Chris and uh, and Ivan and invite uh, Forrest Forbes also uh, on this question. Um, the desire to create educational institutions, to create public schools. Um, how do we so? The, the thing that I find m most challenging there is related to, Chris, what you were talking about in terms of not learning, not teaching, but learning from your students, right? Um, uh, and... Uh, Ivan, that you were talking about in terms of uh, your own experiences uh, uh, with, uh, with justice in education. And so, so I, wanna, I wanna try and understand how we think about the creation of public schools, Kendall, that when we have to rethink pedagogy entirely, the model of the public school here so is more classic it feels to me uh, in terms of educating uh, people um, it feels a little bit more classic in this text than the pedagogy of the oppressed um, 
and Gayatri, we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to you on this because this is what you, you spend your time thinking about uh, in that beautiful setting r right behind you. Uh, but you also raise the question of ideology in a way um, and of the need to think about education through the lens of autocritique and cleansing oneself of particular ideologies. So that's a complicated, that's a lot right there. That's a lot um, because we're talking about institutions, we're talking about ideology, we're talking about um, pedagogy of the oppressed. How, how can we kind of uh, make sense of this? Kendall, do you want to kick us off? Uh, sure, I will, I, will, I will come in. Um, perhaps at the nexus of the two concepts that uh, you put on the table or that were being discussed. Um, the institutional or institutivity, if you will, um, and um, ideology, because um, you know, I'm 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 thinking, um, and and this is also to respond or to continue the conversation that I wanted to have with you, but knew I I couldn't, given um, the limits on time, about this question of crime. Uh, so let me let me just talk about that first, because that's okay. that's what's on my mind. So. I, I, I don't want to deny uh, that crime and criminalization were used in a new way um, after emancipation in which they had not been used before. Um, I, I especially don't want to do that in talking about education because as we know from Khalil Muhammad's magnificent book, The Condemnation of Blackness, um, one of the programs of racist intellectuals beginning at the end of the 19th century and continuing into the 20th. And I, I can't help but think that this influenced uh, the way Du Bois wrote the chapter on the public school and perhaps the whole of Black Reconstruction because he was one of the central protagonists in this. There was, there was this fierce ideological battle um, in which on the one side, uh, these white scholars were trying uh, to, as Muhammad puts it, write crime into race, right? And to criminalize black identities. Um, and to do so, interestingly enough, by arguing that there was a relationship between literacy and criminality, right? Racism, mm -hmm. um, we know, has no fixed propositional content. So these arguments were all over the place. So you'd see arguments that there was a connection between um, illiteracy and crime, you know, ignorant blacks, um, the proletariat committing crimes, and then uh, you would you would hear claims that there was a connection between literacy and crime. So the graduates of the historically black uh, colleges were thought to be, by virtue of their education, right, um, criminals. So too little education makes a black person a criminal. Too much education makes a black person uh, a criminal. So, you know, um, like black criminality, though, black illiteracy was framed as a key measure of black inferiority. And I do think uh, that one of the things this book by its mere existence is trying to do uh, is to refute the charge of black inferiority. Uh, or at least that's um, one of the things that I saw reading it. And it's captured in this notion of, of the inner culture, an inner culture that was not entirely articulate, uh, but which nonetheless had an impact on the world. Um, and um, I, I, I think that, and, and here I'm coming to the question that you put to me uh, earlier. I think that Du Bois is not just an historian of the rise of black literacy and the campaign for uh, public education, but he's also um, a poet or at the very least, 
uh, he's offering us a kind of poetics of education. This is a book by a learned black man uh, in which, and this goes to the point uh, that Bob was making earlier about the textual organization of the book, uh, in which many different forms of writing come together. Um, I, I mentioned the poetics of the book because I was struck in a way that I was not struck when I read the book before by the fact that each of the chapters ends with a fragment of a poem or a song, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and so it's operating uh, in several different uh, discursive registers and the argument of the book is an argument which is not reducible to its propositional content. That's the poetics. Mm -hmm. um, and thus um, the argument about education, it seems to me, while alert to questions of the institutionalization of black learning through the building of schools which were burnt down and torched, right? The hiring of teachers um, who uh, were threatened with lynching or run out of town, right? Uh, there is this ideological component. I won't even call it ideological. I, I will say in keeping with the, the this fragment of an idea of a poetics, um, there is an imagination. And so as I was reading the book, um, I could not help but remind myself that my grandfather's grandfather was a slave, right? So I, I am that close to the experience of, of, of this generation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that does something um, for the reading of the book. So it's not a, I'm, I'm not making a claim about, I'm making a claim in part about the text, but I also wanna make a claim about reading. Uh, and the ways in which something is lost, perhaps, if we see Du Bois is making propositional arguments about education as an institution, okay. as opposed to a poetics and a praxis of freedom. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah, brilliant. Um, um, Flores, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, Kendall and I have had this conversation um, many times about education and, and literacy. And, um, it basically is the foundation for the uh, carceral state. Um, you know, several years ago when I was a uh, real estate developer, I remember a, uh, a black female investment banker telling me that, um, that they use the third grade test scores, reading test scores of black boys in their multiple regression models in order to predict the number of prison beds that are going to be needed when they're developing uh, municipal bonds. Mm. So, you know, so, so we're looking at this whole issue of, of how it can be liberating, obviously, but the fact that it is a, uh, you know, it's a travesty, how education is used, obviously, to enlighten people when they leave uh, prison but how it's also on the back end, developing that pipeline uh, to uh, replenish, you know, those that are leaving to kind of maintain the whole process of recidivism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Flores. Uh, Ivan, that seems to resonate with what you're thinking right now. You wanna turn on your mic? Yeah, yeah. hey, hey, uh... Professor Forbes, how are you? Good to see you too. It's been a while. Uh, I, I think, I, I agree a thousand percent. I think that uh, along with being a poet, I think uh, I think the boy was a mathematician as well. He, he understood a very simple formula that uh, success, uh, however you define it, success is, is, is a function of opportunities. And if you provide educational opportunities, and every, and every opportunity that uh, white Americans were provided with, then uh, the only thing that could follow would be success. Uh, it was particularly education. Education is sort of the cornerstone of this democracy. And if you leave that out, then, then success uh, is, is, is hampered, right? It's very difficult to, to, to attain success. Uh, and I know for me, it was very important. Like I, I dropped out of school when I was in eighth grade. Uh, Ran the streets. I ran away from foster homes, and I and I, I didn't I didn't realize 
the utility. I didn't respect or uh, appreciate the utility of an education. It was either eat now, right, uh, or, or, or get an education. So I didn't, I didn't see how important education was for putting food in my stomach or for putting money in my pocket. Uh, so, uh, and I think uh, uh, as I go to, obviously as I got older, I, I began to understand how important uh, education is. Um, and I think uh, it's, 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 you know, to, to, to take a term from Dr. Thomas, it's been, uh, the, the we education has been weaponized against the black and brown communities. So they've been denied this particular thing for so long, uh, uh, private education anyway. Uh, and that denial has clearly fed into, uh, or has fed the prison, the, the school prison pipeline, right? Uh, uh, and it's a shame. I, I remember, I think it was two years ago, and I was very upset at this. Obama made a statement, and I was, and it pissed me the hell off. Uh, he said, uh, yeah, we're going to turn our, 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 our jails and our prisons into institutions of higher learning. And I'm all for providing educational opportunities to folks who are incarcerated, absolutely. But our institutions of higher learning should be institutions of higher learning, not our prisons. And I was, I was very upset for Obama for even uh, uh, putting those two things in the same sentence. Uh, and, it, and it sort of gives you an idea of how warped uh, a society is with, with regards to when, you know, like, uh, like, the, like Professor Forbes said, uh, the education, uh, it's sort of, uh, it's one of those, uh, one of those uh, the tail wagging the dogisms, right? We've got it all backwards. Uh, if we take care of the educational thing on the front end, we won't have to worry about providing educational opportunities on the back end. We don't have to worry about recidivism rates. We don't have to worry about all these metrics that measure failure. Uh, we, can, we can use metrics that measure success. Uh, anyway, that's my say. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ivan. Um, uh, and so I think that ties into uh, Chris. I want to give you an opportunity to weigh in on this one. I thought I want to go back to Gayatri on, on the work that you do, uh, which uh, you sp spend months uh, working on these questions of pedagogy and education. So, but um, Chris, uh, so how do we think about this, the, the, way, the way you write about it in, uh, in your personal essay uh, about this uh, irreconcilable tension is what keeps me coming back inside the jail, not to educate you, but to be educated by you, you said, right? Um, so how do we how do we think about that uh, aspect of it? I mean, you're spending so much time uh, with men and women at Rikers doing something. What is it that you're doing, right? In a way. Well, the best way I can describe it, uh, Bernard, is that each experience is an exercise in empathy. Right, it's an exercise in seeing outside of my perspective uh, while also seeing uh, uh, myself better and getting a, an understanding of the impact that I have as I move through the world. Um, and I think that when we're in a room together, we all are doing that. So you, you know that I teach a creative writing uh, class at Rikers. I, I've uh, taught there, I think this is my fourth semester that I'm teaching right now. Um, and each time that I, that I um, enter into a facility um, and work with uh, the students in my classroom, you know, not only is it, is it um, uh, an academic uh, process in, in education, but also there's, there's a, just a, a learning and, and observation of hope and faith and resilience and grit um, and again, just empathy, right? And I think that um, to see that constantly, um, it, it just reminds me, you know, of uh, we just recently for the class I'm teaching right now, we just recently read uh, Just Mercy. Uh, that was the first book that we read for the semester. And um, the, term, <coughs> the term proximity, 
is one that <coughs> keeps coming to my mind, being close to and seeing um, this system at work, right? And the people that are affected by this system, right? And um, just walking out with that understanding and um, just not losing sight of that because I think it's so easy to lose sight of that. And it's easy to make it into an academic exercise and conversation and not one where there's practical application to change what's going on. So, you know, I think, I think that that's what my um, experience has been. And, and again, you know, I, I said it in the essay, it's, it's not one <laughs> as a child growing up in the South in North Carolina um, that, you know, I kind of learned in the institutions that 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 I experienced and, and that I grew up in. And you know, going to West Point, you know, that that was another experience experience in itself where there were certain things in, in regards to leadership that I learned. But to uh, be um, in a situation, you know, going from institution to institution, the military uh, to Wall Street, um, and then you know the different ac academic institutions I've been a part of. I've just noticed that the only one that that um, I've walked into where I haven't been, you know, primarily the only person of color is is Rikers Island. That's the only institution that I've walked into where it's primarily people of color throughout the building from the time I, I get on onto that uh, facility. And you know, there's a problem just embedded in that. Right. So I think, again, just that proximity and not losing sight of that and seeing how it plays out each and every day and knowing knowing that, you know, our brothers and sisters are there and experiencing that every day. To me, that's 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 just an education that, that you can't, you know, you will never forget. Um, and one that will just as for me personally, as I move through the world, you know, I'm just constantly, you know, thinking about, you know, how am I moving through the world? How are my decisions playing out? What type of ripple effect do they have, um, positive or negative, um, that kind of enables this system to persist and negatively affect our communities? Thanks for that, Chris. Yeah, I have to, I have to agree and the the experience of walking into any prison or jail in this country um, is is precisely that experience of finding yourself in kind of an institution of persons of color and the fact that we allow that to happen is simply um, beyond the pale of justice. And it's an experience I have every single time I walk into a prison or jail. Yeah, you, you, you know, Bernard, something that I think about as I, as I, you know, just listen to this conversation and taking a look at some of the readings is just this idea of uh, abolition democracy being an iterative process and the necessity for it to be an iterative process. That, that just stems from well, a number of things, but I just think about the elusive nature of racism, you know, and, and kind of specifically thinking about, you know, this conversation about education, the enslaved being denied education, that being something that's codified, right, and, and, and implemented. And I think about, you know, going from, from late 1800s to the 1950s, which is, you know, the era where my father, who who grew up in Arkansas, um, uh, was essentially a young boy who left school every day at noon to go pick cotton, while his white classmates stayed behind and continued to learn. Right, and then you look at, you know, I think about my education and the fact that. Um, you know, what we were taught and what we were not taught in terms of black history, right? Um, and, and 
you know, wh what's the, the consequence of that, right? And then again, you know, just thinking about walking into um, the academic institutions that I've walked into and, you know, seeing who was teaching, right? And, you know, just thinking, thinking about the class that I, that I um, taught last semester in the spring, incarcerated yet inspired, I had a, a student, I think I had three students of color in that class. And, you know, one of them came up to me after that class and said, you know, Professor, you, you're the first, like, you know, male teacher I've had since I've been here. Th that alone has made this a special experience for me. I'm just like, damn, that's unfortunate. And that's sad. And, you know, again, just thinking about the iterative processes because the elusive nature of it, how it, you know, as I think about it, how elusive racism is and how it further embeds itself in, in institutions and manifests in different forms so that we, we have to be iterative to figure out how to come at it again and, and what new tactics need to be employed to root it out and make uh, substantial change, positive change. Thanks, Chris. That's so important. Uh, can I read a quote? Uh, go, ahead, go ahead. Sorry, Evan. So I just said these words sort of ring true today as much as they did back then. So uh, this is on page seven. Uh, page uh, seven of uh, Angela Davis? No, uh, Du Bois, I'm sorry. Of Du Bois? Sorry, go ahead. And uh, it's the uh, uh, second to last The paragraph. black worker, second to last paragraph. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead, read it. So I'm gonna, as slavery grew to a system and the cotton kingdom began to expand into imperial, into imperial white domination, a free Negro was a contradiction, a threat and a menace. As a thief and a vagabond, he threatened society. But as an educated property holder, a successful mechanic, or even, or even professional man, he more than threatened slavery. We can sort of change slavery for mass incarceration now. Um, mm -hmm. He contradicted and undermined it. He must not be. He must be suppressed, enslaved, colonized. And nothing so bad could be said about him that that did not easily appear as true slave holders. So I just think that rings as true today as it did back then that uh, black and brown people who become educated are a direct threat to the status quo. And it, direct threat to mass incarceration, obviously. Right. Uh, they, okay. they, paradox. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kendall. That's the paradox um, of the, um, what I'll call the educational industrial complex, right, uh, for, for Black people, right? It um, is both a, a site and a vehicle for development and a site and vehicle for underdevelopment. And I'm reminded um, of what Manning Marable says in his book, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America, right? um, the central thesis of which is that the American social contract exists not to develop, but to underdevelop Black people, right? So it's an account um, of the, the development of underdevelopment, to use a famous phrase. Um, and how is it? Uh, it goes directly to the question of, uh, of, of uh, iteration. How is it that this same social practice can operate simultaneously uh, across different classes, uh, across gender, um, et cetera, in, in such a radically different way, right? And how are we to think right, a politics of education that can negotiate uh, between the, you know, the, the, the scylla of education as development and, and, and the charybdis um, of education as a tool for the reproduction of relations of domination and subjugation. Through the humanities beyond the disciplines. I agree with you, God. You know, the, that's why I thought, and also as the only foreigner, the only woman, I, want to, I don't want to remain silent for too long. Okay, so Please. therefore, Go ahead. Go ahead. I, did, Go ahead. I am going ahead, sweetie. I mean, I have had to fight. I'm sorry to call you, sweetie. I'm, I'm 78 years old. But uh, I have had to fight for my position within English literature, a totally, totally, totally inhabited by white guys. So that and I was educated in India. My BA is from the University of Calcutta. Can you imagine how much 
one had to soldier in order to get into that so that you're running with the blonde head and blue eyed boys and sometimes even winning a little. So therefore, I do assert myself. But the thing, I don't want to bring those things up because I now have a lot of institutional power. But I did look at these pictures. And I, look at these guys. <laughs> let, let, them, let me talk again about education. Now, the thing about education, Bernard, is that I teach not only in the villages now for 36 years, but also at the top. And believe me, they need as much help because they, I mean, I, I, mean, I teach at Columbia University in the city of New York in the dominant language department, English. And I teach, I take people, uh, you know, like I choose them, etc. But what do I find? They're no longer taught how to read. They are taught how to control through their intelligence. They can cut everything down to the size of their black boxes. And every text proves a point that they want to make. Okay. That's why I'm, I'm very interested in Christopher's point about learning to learn how to teach these people, not just the bottom, but the top, because they are so dis they, are, they can be so destructive that they don't even know that they don't know how to read. You know, and I, I love them. They're my students. You know, students become non-human beings. I kind of love them. I love them. But the thing is, in that kind of a situation at Columbia, you know, what is it? I keep saying, what is it to to read? And I want to read page 120, to read from uh, Du Bois. To read is to try to imagine the other from the, to resist having everything be relevant just to me, 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 me. I became, Christopher, a tenure track assistant professor in the fall of 1965, okay? In a department where I was the only person of color, all white guys the only person of color, the only female. And I had had just four years out of India. And in India, I did not know a single white person, okay? I discovered racism when I crossed the channel into Britain. I, mean, I, I was feeling something. And my boyfriend, Talbot Spivak, said, have a beer, it's racism you're feeling. Because I, <laughs> because I, because I lived right in India, you were all brown folks, and I was upper caste. So how do I know anything? I didn't know. So I get your point, man. So therefore, what is it to learn to read? Here, here is the voice, able to imagine. 121, bottom. Can we imagine this spectacular revolution? Not, of course, unless we think of these people as human beings like ourselves, and then he turns it around ourselves as human beings like them. He doesn't say it, but that's the secret. Not unless assuming this common humanity, we conceive ourselves in a position where we are chattels and real estate, and then suddenly in a night become, quote, thenceforward and forever free. Unless we can do this, there is of course no point in thinking of this central figure in emancipation. So this point that you have to be able to go into the other, resisting like this, resisting your desire for controlling, because it's very common. This is something it's very hard to teach at the top. I hope some of my students at Columbia are hearing this because I do this every time. I make them, I'm so far away from them that I have to, because I started teaching so long ago, I have to have them write reading responses to everything so that I know how to teach. I have to learn how to teach them. And this is not just at the bottom. This is also at the top. And I hesitate calling my schools and the villages the bottom. I'm just using, you're speaking English. Okay, now Barra, stop me because you know I do want to say this. This here thing is something I share when I read, for example, Du Bois's two stints at the school in Tennessee, right? He says, I mean, I'll just give you two little details. He says that sometimes the students don't come and, and I go to the houses of their uh, parents and grandparents and they say they are needed for the crops. That's what happens to my students too. 
you know, when the paddy is being cut, they're not coming to school. The poorest of the poor, they play with the shit in the woods and they play with bits of bricks. That's all they have. And so the, therefore, that's one. And the other one that he gave was that the, 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 the um, grandmother said, no, Laguni has to look after the child because the mother goes out to share crop. Exact same thing. They say the grandfather takes him away because he has to make some money looking after other people's goats. So he's not in my school. And the girl has to look after the child because the mother goes sharecropping. So that situ in that situation, when I am fortunate enough to be the daughter of intellectual anti-casteists, non-nationalists, incredibly giving folks, my parents were fantastic. We were not, we were in the middle class. We were not rich, but because to be poor in India means something else, but we were in the middle class. And they taught, brought me up like this. Metropolitan, I came first class first in um, my BA. So how do I, they are my fellow Indians. The only thing I share with them is that we vote. So how do I approach them? I say to them again and again, I'm your enemy. I'm a caste Hindu. For thousands of years, I have ruined, I'm good, my parents were good, but two generations don't undermine thousands of years of oppression. And so therefore, you, I cannot, I, because we have done this and anybody who says, you see the imagination, Kendall, is there. Funnily enough, the imagination is there, whatever is done to the cognitive um, things. But when for thousands of years, you do not allow people, and I'm not now talking about hundreds of years, you do not allow people to want intellectual labor, you punish them for intellectual labor, you make them obey. It is stupid to think that they're, in that case, historical crimes should be committed. If they know everything already, what they should want, etc. That is a, a, an impractical excuse. So I say to them, you know, intellectual labor, which in Bengali is matha khatano, making the head work, the, just as you make the body work, that you folks make the body work, we, may, we make the mind work, okay? So I can't teach it to you. You have to, because you have to, you can, you're just following me when I'm trying to problem solve with students in class. Don't, to the teachers I say. So you have to, because sometimes of course something happens and I feel like I've passed an exam. But you have to tell me, I say to them, if they were listening to me, they don't understand English, but they would uh, know that I'm saying exactly what I say to them. You have to, and I've been doing this for many, many decades, right? You have to uh, somehow make it possible for me to get into uh, teaching you how to do this impossible thing, which is making the head work for nothing. Because you see, everybody is giving them things, top-down philanthropy. So, and the human rights people, right? If, if you do not train them into the subjectship of human rights, 18th century France, what do they think the human rights people are doing? Just giving them arms, okay? And I say, I don't give, that, give you anything but your salaries because, they're not, because you're working in the schools. I'm not here to give you anything. I'm here to teach you. And it's completely impossible for me to do it. I'm constantly trying to learn, constantly trying to learn. I'll be talking, see, the, the two sides come together. Okay? I'm teaching now a, a mathematics course together. See, because this is your idea of learning to learn. So uh, the, um, I'm teaching a mathematics course together. The guy, he's a very nice guy, but he's totally like a white male mathematician. Okay, he's like, I mean, I'm sorry to be saying this. If he's listening, please forgive me, Michael. But the thing, but the thing is, I've said this actually. And if, you know, in a friendly way, I, white guys are my friends. I wouldn't want my daughter to marry one, but it's okay. But so the, the, thing, the thing is that in this kind of a situation, you know, the, I see that it's very, very possible to not pay any attention to how to learn from the students, right? So therefore, in this case, the, what I'm doing is we, we read a book about imagining numbers, which is a fantastic book by the dissertation director of this guy, square root of minus one, okay? irrational number, can you imagine it? And it, of course it's irrational because it's not a fraction. I didn't know this, I just found out this semester. And so he's done a thing up to uh, 93 times decimal, okay? 
So I am actually doing this with my students and my teachers and my, what you may call it, and my uh, supervisors. I, Saturday night, I will call them again, okay? We call, they have cell phones, right? So we are actually doing this. And I'm saying, now, what's your problem? Because mathematics is a, is a good thing. So what's your problem? Imagining mathematics is the big deal here, right? Imagine. So say, you do it, you do it. Tell me what your problem is, and I will connect you to that white guy who's a really, really the dissertation director of my co-teacher. So you see, it's to bring the two sides together so that I can devise a pedagogy that will put the insertion, that will insert into these children the, uh, uh, the intuitions of democracy as a habit, you know, class struggle and yet no competition, uh, gender uh, affirmation and yet no uh, e equality and the, no, no training into leadership. Franz Fano teaches us that. Leaderism is the worst thing in these post-colonial nations, okay? So how do I do that? But therefore at the top also, I have to undermine that because there is this idea of controlling and top-down philanthropizing. We are the best people in the world. We've got to help everyone unless we kill them. And so what is it to help? And this is why I like Barnard's book, you know, that it's not just what is it to help, but who am I to help? You know, you try teaching that at Columbia at the top, the global um, classroom, so-called, you know, they all want to help everyone. You'll see how hard it is. It's just, I, you know, I've been in prison myself, but I've never taught uh, in a prison. But I would, I would suggest from my very limited experience that it would, uh, it's just as difficult, imprisoned by the superpower conviction that we can help the world, which is the other side of we can kill the world. So you see, this is why your idea and Du Bois's work, just one more sentence, Du Bois's work, he didn't stay, you see, there is a notebook in Ghana where he died, which they had miscatalogued, uh, um, which is actually his notebook about these village schools, right? So you see that although he was teaching with his whole heart, he was himself very organized, all squares and what he's doing, how, many, how much time, etc. So Du Bois was an organized man, and he was, in fact, not a, a fantastic teacher, okay? He was like very stern, remote from his, and I want to say this because he's a real man. He's not just a hero, he's my brother, because I too am a poor teacher. I have all these ideas, but I can't teach well, too impassioned. His, his was the opposite. But what did he try to do? He did not try to remain among the subalterns. What he tried to do in Atlanta was to produce, this was unbelievable how hard he worked, but what he, how hard he worked because those documents are still available. He tried to produce in Atlanta an entire black readership which would know its history, its social uh, problems, statistics, and statistics thickened out with narrative and, and he was stopped. By whom? Booker T. Washington. Why? Because he had criticized Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee. Tuskegee. So that to an extent, and remember that there he said one day when he knew, as he, and this is a very well-known story, as he was walking to the newspaper office that the knuckles of the uh, guy lynched the, uh, the day before was going to be in a shop window. He said, he came back, he didn't go to the thing. And he said, the way I teach the scientific uh, social studies cannot be taught. I must enter propaganda, he said. I must teach differently. This connects him with Antonio Gramsci, says the new intellectual learning from the, uh, learning from the environment of the subaltern, the one who is not, does not have access to citizenship rights. The learning from that environment, the new intellectual must be a permanent persuader, a permanent persuader. That's Gramsci and Du Bois propaganda. I cannot teach in this impartial teaching is not my thing, but that too he was stopped from doing. So therefore Du Bois's teaching accounts are not just to be read about, but also to be seen. The village thing he left behind because this village thing is in fact 
not something, it's a very long-term kind of idea and it won't succeed. I know I won't succeed, but the, the production of a middle class who is which is absolutely aware in detail, not just identitarianism, everybody. This is why I said he can't be patronized. That, you know, everybody oppressed us, oh, well, oh, well. That's not, that was not the situation. The situation was extraordinarily hard work through these conferences. And I'm sure Bob will agree with me that these, when one looks at the documents of the Atlanta experiment, one realizes he worked his head off, but then his, uh, his teaching position was not continued. And so therefore, it's a, it's a learning to learn from the other side it is a wonderful idea. It's not always possible because not everybody is a good teacher. We can think, we are moved, we are impassioned, but we may not be because, as I say, Du Bois was a firm, very uh, remote and frightening teacher is what people say. I've even had I even know someone who in 1958 had Du Bois come to his class at Harvard and teach him. And so therefore, I mean, we can't all be. And one thing I will say, Du Bois was not born, Du Bois was born into a free um, uh, community. When he looks back into, he also had to go to Fisk to find out about real racism. All these accounts are there and find out about the the nature, I mean, of course he knew, but the real nature of slavery went at 16, I think. And so that we have to think of him as a real human being rather than here, as I say, he's my neighbor. I, I live in Washington Heights. He lived on the Silver Hill, but then he went to Brooklyn, but the, on Ed, Edgecombe Road, there is his apartment. But so I try to think about him in the way that he wants me to think about him. So that's how, what I will say about learning to learn from the other how to teach him or her. That's what I really, I resonate with you, but I just want to tell you at the top, it's needed just as much, not just only at the bottom. This should not, okay, anyway. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gayatri. Um, uh, so we're, we have three questions. Um, from the audience and um, we should try to get to them. I know we're running out of time, drastically running out of time, but there's one that's uh, for Bob uh, asking you to explain a little bit more the relationship between Dubosian abolition democracy and the Hegelian idealism that you were mentioned twice. Um, and uh, maybe to kind of quickly kind of uh, a lot of people I think were curious uh, by what you were suggesting. And so maybe just a, why don't we start there? Right, you know, I, I, I think the first time I invoked Hegel, I was thinking of uh, something like, uh, you know, the Hegelian figure of a, of a distinction between what uh, consciousness is for itself and what it is in itself. You know, what, you know, by analogy, what, uh, uh, the content, the normative content of the abolitionist uh, 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 ideal, you know, I suggested, uh, uh, outstripped or exceeded the uh, self-understanding, uh, 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 the understanding of the ideal by by its proponents. That was that was one thought, and then in talking, and, and then in resp and then you know, vis-a-vis -vis what 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 Kendall was saying, I, I think I invoked Hegel again there. I was. I, I guess I had maybe a text like the philosophy of right in, the, in, in mind, you know, just the idea that we can think of uh, uh, if you, you know, one way of reading the uh, uh, philosophy of right uh, is, 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 is as an exposition uh, of, of, of a concept of reciprocal recognition as an articulation of different moments of that concept. And so, so the thought then is that we can think of, of, of institutions as, as embodying different moments of, uh, of the articulation of a concept. Um, that, by the way, is not antithetical to thinking about the institutions as embodiments of freedom, you know. Um, uh, so, so I, I, I want to resist a little bit the uh, dis the the distinction that that Kindle suggested between between thinking in terms of institutions and thinking in terms of a practice of freedom. I don't think that if you're coming at this from a kind of Hegelian point of view, those two things aren't necessarily at odds. Poetics is something different. I won't, you know, but I but 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 
as far as institutions go. But I completely agree 100% that the poetic, the imaginative, that, that, that these are extremely important categories uh, 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 for thinking about what Du Bois is up to, not just in Black Reconstruction, but, but everywhere. And voice, again, going all the way back to a text like Darkwater is himself explicitly conscious of the complementarity between, between, if you will, the poetic and, 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 the, and the philosophical or the poetic and the sociological. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. That was from David Norman, the question. Actually, so we've got, I've got two other questions that are coming in online and uh, Sonia Anwar, one of our students who's remote, but just joined us right now has two questions. I want you to ask the second one, Sonia. Let me just say quickly though, that um, uh, Dogu Khan Bingol has an interesting question about legal institutions and new legal institutions. Um, and um, and on through the YouTube, we got an interesting question about the relationship between racial literacy and uh, public schools and white supremacy asking basically whether all attacks on public education might be motivated in part by a backlash against racial literacy. Um, so these are all excellent questions. I'm not sure we're going to be able to address them all, but uh, Sonia, uh, can you uh, raise your second question? And we have students who are both here in the classroom and uh, online. Uh, so go ahead, Sonia. So my question is for uh, the panel, um, and it has um, it comes from the 16th chapter of the book. There is a passage there, the, the 16th chapter begins with this. It's the where Du Bois um, says, how civil war in the South began again, indeed had never ceased, and how black Prometheus bound the rock of ages by hate, hurt and humiliation, has his vitals eaten out as they grow, yet lives and fights. And I found this to be profoundly, the, the, the imagery is very profound as elsewhere in the book and its poetic components that Professor um, Thomas uh, mentioned. And I guess my, my, my question is, is there is this, the, the, for example, in this imagery, the gifts um, given by the black persons, the public schooling concept, democracy foundations made by black people, a mythological equivalent of the fire to humankind and to be weighed down by being relentlessly bound. Um, if that is the materialism of political economy, this tie, this back and forth yin yang of idealism and materialism. And um, my question when it comes down to it is whether there is, whether you see this as a causality dilemma when we talk about idealism and materialism in, in Du Bois whether we, we continue to see this in contemporary politics, this, this ongoing clash or fusion of ideals and institutions, where it is hard to tell sometimes what begets what and what brings about the demise of the other. Um, and, and to summarize, aren't, aren't ideals born out of and come into being as responses to institutions and aren't institutions shaped out of idealistic needs, whether they are to elevate or whether they, they exist to contain the ideals. So that's a terrific question. And I think this will be our last, uh, maybe our last uh, intervention uh, before we close. Uh, anyone in particular would like to take this? Amazing metaphor uh, at the beginning of that chapter and, uh, and, yeah. and address it. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't read uh, Du Bois in some time, but, but, but I think that if we believe that institutional racism is uh, baked into the system, then so what motivates those institutions to, uh, to deny and uh, to repress and to motivate? You know, I, I think it's really important to think about the uh, you know, you look at look at the the intent. You know, the the I believe the intent of the exception clause of the Thirteenth Amendment was to control black bodies. Uh, it, the the motivation came for the suppression of emancipation, which was one of the major uh, issues of that time. And so, all of these institutions have been evolved over time with this Constitution with this motivation. So I believe that it's, it's you know, I, I, I believe that it's, it's very difficult to say that the institutions are, uh, you know, 
the motivation of the institutions is the same as it was 200 years ago or 300 years ago. Is it time Thank for, you. For, for a word? Yes, about yes. Issue? Kendall, last, last but, one. If so, do we need to ask whether all attacks on black education may be motivated in part by a backlash against racial, racial literacy? Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I, I wanna just read very briefly uh, a sentence from um, a book by Joe Richardson called Christian Reconstruction, the American Missionary Association and Southern Blacks in which a Freedmen's Bureau officer reports, a Negro riding on a loaded wagon or sitting on a hack waiting for a train or by the cabin door is often seen book in hand delving after the rudiments of knowledge, a group on the platform of the depot after carefully conning an old spelling book resolves into a class. This is a wonderful utopian model of learning community and of a, of a sociality which is not the hierarchical one that those of us who teach at elite institutions uh, like Columbia and elsewhere know, where the teacher stands in front of the room um, uh, teaching uh, the students and where the roles are, are baked in. But there's a, there's a seamy underside to that, um, that vision of a communitarian kind of hoda jisamba, uh, democratic learning uh, 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 circle. Uh, in the complaint in a case, a 2016 case brought in the Sixth Circuit called Gary B. versus Snyder, in which the parties, uh, Detroit public school students sued the Department of Education of the state of Michigan and the governor, um, alleging that the state of the public schools in Detroit denied them their constitutionally guaranteed right to literacy. And in the complaint, I recommend it to you, it's horrific reading. Uh, among other things, they talk about an eighth grade class, which is taught by an 11th grader because the Department of Education refuses to send qualified teachers to that school. So we are separated uh, by almost you know, uh, 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 two centuries, uh, at least 150 years from reconstruction and, and, and the Detroit schools. And yet here we are. Uh, the first, uh, a utopian image. Uh, the second one, a damning indictment uh, of the failure of uh, the American experiment to the extent that that experiment uh, claims as the court does in Brown versus the Board of Education, that education is the foundation of citizenship. It is that vision uh, of the weaponization of literacy and illiteracy that is at the root of the pronouncement of Donald Trump in 2016 uh, after the Nevada primaries. Uh, and I quote him here, I love the uneducated. There's a reason for that. Okay, one sentence. Let's go global on this one. This class apartheid and race apartheid and gender apartheid in education is what is making our world. This is the largest sector of the electorate Democracy has body count. You are going to experience it very soon. You're already experiencing it. Therefore, a world ruled by tyrants. This is a global fact. It's a class, gender, race, apartheid yep. in education. It's an assault on literacy, right? Uh, in the name of illiberal authoritarianism. And just literacy does nothing. Do, do we send our children to school for literacy? No, we send them for education. This is why I don't, don't like to, uh, to have my schools be called literacy projects. No, sir. I, have a, I, have a, I think I have a different and richer concern. I understand. Race, race literacy is a different thing, of course. Wow. Well, uh, I think we could go on for so much longer, which is a tribute to this extraordinary text. And of course, Angela Davis's extraordinary work building on it. Um, but we unfortunately are 10 minutes over. So I think we'll have to bring this to a close. I did want to, I did want to pick up, Chris, on the point you were making about the iterativeness, the iterative process of justice, which, um, which I tried to build on in a post. So I'll just refer to the post. Uh, it's called "Abolition Democracy as a Philosophy of History," where it really I do get this sense that one of the things that Angela Davis added to uh, the idea of abolition democracy was 
constituting it as a philosophy of social change and of history, um, very different than more familiar philosophies of history that we, we are accustomed to. Um, and in that sense, it's really an extraordinarily powerful and motivating way of thinking about uh, an unending process of historical change where we achieve something, but that only opens up new questions and new vistas and new ambitions for us uh, to work on. And of course, that might be the perfect way to think about abolition democracy today. Um, uh, so, but I spell that out in, in, in that post and I'll refer you to that. Uh, I do want to close then, maybe I, I, if, I'm, if I'm allowed to, Chris, by reading your last two sentences, may I, may I, may I do that? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. The most beautifulest thing in this world is our collective freedom. The freedom from America's reckless oppression, freedom from her nonchalant knees on our necks, freedom to forgive, to evolve, to learn, to love. It is our freedom to come back home from our darkest place and for our remaining days, live life to its fullest. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Chris, uh, for this beautiful uh, personal essay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Gayatri, for joining us, for uh, Bob, uh, uh, Flores, Ivan, Chris, Kendall, uh, it's been really a spectacular conversation. I have learned so much and I am so deeply indebted to you for this. Thank you everyone for joining us, all of our students. I wanna give a special shout out to Fonda Shen and to Adebambo Adesania who uh, make all of this possible uh, behind the scenes. Thank you, um, thank everyone. And I can't wait to continue the conversation. Uh, we'll be turning next to uh, abolish the police. So we're going to dip right into the contemporary uh, in the next session. And we've got a terrific panel. So I hope you will join us. Uh, I think it's October 29th, but it's going to show up on the next slide. All right, everyone. Thank you immensely. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bernard. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, Thank Bob. Good to see you. Good Thank to you. see you guys. Hey, good to see you, Kendall and Gayatri. And well, I haven't seen other you. folks that I haven't met before. I, I, I'll reach out to you. Yes, let's do something. Okay, we will. Bye. See you, folks. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. You thank you, Christopher. Thank you, thank you Carlos. Good night. God bless. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. joining. And Carlos, thank you for your approval. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Good job. Thank you all.